Good day, boys and girls, and welcome to another episode of Learn BMX Racing. This video will teach you how to choose your very first BMX race bike. Now, over the years I've been creating these videos, I've had the pleasure of meeting many members of my audience in person. And I know you good folks span a huge range of ages and backgrounds, from eight-year-old girls to 60-year-old men, and everyone in between. Obviously, the ideal bicycle for an eight-year-old girl and a 60-year-old man will be very different machines. And when it comes to purchasing a bicycle, you all have different needs, different budgets, and different preferences. Therefore, the most sensible way I can help my viewers choose your very first BMX race bike is to share an immense amount of information about the basic variations and features of bicycles. That way, each of you will become well-informed consumers armed with the knowledge to make an educated decision about the type of bicycle which fits your needs the best. Oh, and one last thing. You may notice that I'm not at a BMX track this time. Well, I decided that for this video, I would do it out where BMX began for a lot of us, on paths, winding through the woods. As I'm sure you know, there are many different styles and types of bicycles. And there are also very different and distinct styles of BMX bikes. Walking into a bike shop and saying, I want a BMX bike, is the equivalent of walking into a car dealership and saying, I want a car, right? I mean, you need to be a lot more specific. Just like there are many different types of cars used for different purposes, from vans to Jeeps to pickup trucks to sports cars to sedans, there are also many different types of BMX bicycles, specialized to different types of riding. First, you have the old school bicycles from the 1970s and 1980s. Now, back in the 1970s, all BMX bikes were race bikes. There was no such thing as freestyle in the 1970s. In the 1980s, BMX bikes were in one of two categories. They were either freestyle bikes or race bikes. And that was it. And if you already own one of these older race bikes, it's fine to use that bike for racing today. But I would never recommend purchasing one of these bikes. Collectors have made those old bikes unreasonably overpriced. Plus, they're about 10 to 15 pounds heavier than a modern race bike. They're just simply not worth the money. Why buy some cumbersome, outdated used bike from 1985 for $3,500 when you can buy a far more nimble, lightweight, and stronger new bike for 500 bucks. The next category is dirt or jump bikes used for riding on dirt jump trails. Now, while you could technically race BMX on one of these bikes, they typically have the wrong gearing and extra components like gyros, which are not necessary for racing. The first three or four times that I rode on a BMX track, I used this, my 2006 Haro Bag Trail, because it was the only BMX bike I had. Incidentally, if that location looks familiar and you're thinking to yourself, did he photograph his bike in front of the Bat Cave from the Batman TV series? <laughs> Come on, man. I live in LA, baby. Of course I photographed it in front of the Bat Cave. And it worked just fine for those first few practice days. But it's not a practical or sensible bike to race long term. Then we have modern day freestyle bikes, which are specialized into three distinct disciplines of flatland, park, and street bikes. These are used for doing flatland freestyle tricks on flat ground, transition tricks on ramps or in concrete bike parks, or 
riding on public streets and doing streets, doing streets, doing tricks <laughs> on city architecture. Now, this video is not going to talk about any of those styles of BMX bikes. This video is going to focus exclusively on choosing your first BMX race bike used for racing on BMX racetracks. Now, race bikes have four main styles. There are bikes with tires that are 20 inches in diameter, and those are called class bikes. Now, class bikes are the most common and dominant style of bike. 22 to 29 inch diameter tire bikes are called cruisers. And really small bikes with 12 inch tires for toddlers are called balance bikes. And finally, there are the micro mini junior bikes, which are mainly intended for preteen children. Now, we'll talk about different sizes in more detail later, but right now it's just important to understand how to distinguish the different bikes that this essay will cover. So, how can you tell the difference between all these categories of BMX bikes? How do you know that you have a BMX race bike instead of a freestyle or dirt bike? Well, here are four traits which identify a race bike. Race bikes always include a mandatory rear brake. Usually they're disc brakes or V brakes, but they're never a coaster brake. Coaster brakes are typically found on beach cruisers and really cheap children's bikes. These are the type of brakes that activate when you pedal backwards. And the way you can tell if a bike has coaster brakes is that the coaster brake always has this metal arm coming off of the hub, which is physically bolted to the frame of the bicycle. Now, front brakes are optional, but they're not necessary. Race bikes never come with axle pegs. Pegs are actually not allowed on the track for safety reasons. Race bikes never come with 25.9 gearing. Typically, they have 44.16 gearing. And if you've seen other videos I've made, you know that the 25.9-44.16 is a reference to the quantity of teeth on the front chainring and on the rear cog. So 44.16 means 44 teeth on the front and 16 in the back. Race bikes never come with a gyro. Now, while you are allowed to have a gyro installed on a race bike, they're just not necessary. As a side note, almost every new bike includes a kickstand, reflectors, and a chain guard, but those must be removed to use the bicycle on the racetrack. Let's recap everything I just explained. Here is an example of a freestyle BMX bike with all the bells and whistles that you do not want on a race bike. Then here is a quality bare bones race bike. Let's compare the two. You can see the freestyle bike has reflectors. There is a rear reflector on the seat post, a front reflector on the stem, and spoke reflectors. The race bike, no reflectors. The freestyle bike has a clear plastic chain guard over the chain. The race bike, no chain guard. The freestyle bike has 25-9 gearing with 25 teeth on the front sprocket and 9 on the rear cog. The race bike has 44-16. The freestyle bike has axle pegs, which are these little pipes attached to the axle so you can stand on them and do tricks. The race bike does not have axle pegs. The freestyle bike has front and rear brakes, and while you can have front and rear brakes on a race bike, the race bike just has the mandatory rear brakes. And finally, the freestyle bike has a gyro, which is this rotational device attached to the stem which splits the brake cable into two lines and allows the handlebars to spin indefinitely without tangling the brake cables. Now it's not against the rules for a race bike to have a gyro, but it's not necessary to have one. Now that you know how to identify a race bike, let's talk about how the bikes are put together. 
There are three ways bicycles can be put together when you buy them. And these types of assembly are often called builds. You have completes, customs, and kits. Now, most bicycles are sold as completes, meaning they are 95 to 100 percent assembled when you purchase them. When you buy a complete at a bike shop, it will be 100 percent assembled. If you order a complete by mail and have it shipped to your house, well, you may need to put on the pedals or a tire, so it's really about 95 percent assembled. But it's still considered a complete because it contains all the parts you will need to complete the bike. Not only is a complete the most common way to acquire a bicycle, this also tends to be the most affordable option, usually around $100 to $800. You can also buy every single part and component separately, which is known as a custom build. You buy a frame, you buy the wheels, you buy the cranks. Every single piece of the bike is purchased separately and assembled. Custom builds are the most common way for really experienced and professional riders to put their bicycles together. And this also tends to be the most expensive, probably from around $1,200 to as much as $5,000. Now the third option, a kit build, falls somewhere in between. Now kits are probably the least common type of bicycle builds. And with a kit build, you buy the frame and fork as one item. Then for all the other parts, you buy a single kit, which puts all the pieces you need in one package. You still assemble the bike yourself, like a custom build, but you don't have to worry about purchasing incompatible components, since the kit is designed to have everything fit together. Kit builds are really not very common, with race bikes, typically kit builds are done with freestyle bikes. And these will usually run from about $800 to $1,200. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, as with all mechanical devices, the myriad of parts and components available for bicycles are not all compatible with one another. So you really need to know what you're doing if you choose a custom build. If you're new to BMX, don't try to build a custom bike. Just buy a complete. Not only is a complete more affordable, but if you're inexperienced, you will inevitably make some mistakes on a custom build. And those just end up costing you even more money. Hopefully, you're going to stick with BMX racing for years to come, and therefore, your first bicycle will not be your only bicycle. Purchase your first bike as a complete, and in time, you can modify it and change out various components. You can add new pedals, get different handlebars, change the tires, put on some new cranks. And during that gradual process of upgrading parts on your bicycle over the course of many months, you will learn how bicycles are put together. Then, once you have acquired that experience and knowledge, you can make your second bicycle a custom build. But ideally, give yourself at least a year of changing parts and components on your first bike before you attempt to build one. Now, my Chase Edge is a complete, but I changed out the handlebars, the grips, the seat, the tires, the chain ring, and I changed my pedals to something a little bit more grippy. And that is a good segue into talking about what materials a bike is made from. Now, bicycle frames are usually constructed from one of four different types of materials, and each material gets progressively lighter, stronger, and more expensive. The first is high tensile steel, often abbreviated as high 10, and this is the heaviest, weakest, and cheapest metal. High 10 steel frames are fine for young riders up to the age of 12. But if you are 13 or over, high 10 steel bikes are typically not safe or strong enough for aggressive riding. These are bicycles intended for grade school children. By the time you hit high school, you shouldn't be racing on a high 10 steel bike because it will break. Next is 
chromium molybdenum, often abbreviated as chromo, chromoly, or chromoly. And this is a steel alloy which is stronger and lighter than steel, and is what all quality BMX frames were made from in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, chromoly still remains the most high-end material for BMX freestyle bikes, but it is far less common on BMX race bikes, just because it's a little too heavy. Next, we have aluminum bike frames, often designated with the numbers 6061 or 7075. And this is not the same aluminum they make soda cans from, <laughs> okay? Metallurgy technology has come a long way, and the heat-treated aluminum bike frames of today are even lighter and stronger than chromoly. 90% of race bikes at the track today are aluminum frames. Now, 7075 is a little stronger than 6061, so you will often see frames made of 6061 and components like chain rings made of 7075. Carbon fiber is the top of the line and is very lightweight and very expensive. The cheapest carbon fiber frames start at around $1,200. And that is not the whole bike. That is just for the frame itself. And you'll easily spend another $500 to $1,000 getting all the other parts. For most riders, carbon fiber is overkill until you are at least an expert. Next, we'll cover how much the bikes cost. And believe me, I understand that for some families, these bicycles are extremely expensive. When I was a teenager, there was no way my family could afford to spend $370 on my Haro Master. I had to get a job and earn the money to buy that bike myself. My advice is always buy a quality brand name of bicycle. And if a new bike is out of your budget, buy a used one. A well-made used bike is far superior to a poorly constructed new one. And while I can't give you prices on used bikes, I can tell you what to expect for new ones. It's important to understand with new bicycle pricing that you're really paying for the quality of the machine and not for the size of it. So for example, if we look at some chase bikes, we can see that the smallest bike, the micro, is 679. And the full-size adult bike of the chase edge model is 709. So it's not a huge price difference, even though the micro is physically a much smaller bike than the pro. The same thing applies if we look at some Haro bicycles. So the Haro Pro is about 690, right? And then we can see here that the micro is 640. So it's really only about a $50 price difference between these two bicycles, even though the Pro is physically much larger. And if you look right here at the cruiser bike, the Pro 24, that's 720. So again, it's, it's only about, what, $30 more expensive than the Pro. Finally, we can see the exact same thing here on the website for GT bicycles. So if we come down and we look at the Pro bike for GT, the Mach 1, that's 450. But <laughs> all of these smaller bikes are also the exact same price, $450 for the Mach 1 Mini, the Junior, the Expert. So again, you're not paying for the size of the bike, right? It may seem like, well, a smaller bike should cost less money and a bigger bike should cost more money. But no, you're really paying for the quality of the machine. And that's why all the prices are pretty close to one another. Now, having established that all quality bikes are going to be kind of in the same price range, this is what you're looking at for brand new BMX bikes. So in the $80 to $200 range, those are the really cheap low-end bikes, and you really don't want one of those. $200 to $400, that tends to be a pretty decent price for low-quality bikes. 
these are the kind of bikes that are mainly for kids who are maybe age 12 and under. Then you get into the $400 to $800 range. That's a really good, respectable quality of bike, and that's mostly for teenagers and adults. Then once you get over $800, well, they're, <laughs> they're all pretty much awesome and really great, excellent quality bikes when you get into that kind of a price range. When it comes to getting your bike, you have to make two decisions. Let's call them uh, ownership and acquisition. So first is ownership. Do you want a loaner or a rental bike that's owned by someone else? A used bike that was formerly owned by someone else? <laughs> or a brand new bike that will have only been owned by you? And second is acquisition. Do you want to acquire that bike from a private seller, from a bike shop that you visit in person, or the internet where you can order by mail? So let's look at all of those choices in more detail. The easiest and most affordable way to get a bike is to just borrow one from a friend. Maybe you know someone with an extra bicycle and you can use theirs. Now, many BMX tracks also offer loaner or rental bikes. Now keep in mind, every BMX track is different, right? So some are run by a single family, they don't have a lot of money, and they rely on volunteers to help keep the track going. Now those little tracks might not be able to afford a stable of loaner bikes and equipment, whereas other BMX tracks might have a big corporate sponsor and a payroll of employees and a huge supply of loaner bikes and gear. This is why it's so important to visit your local track and speak to the track operator so you know what is available at their facility. When it comes to used bikes, you can find them on the internet, like eBay or Craigslist or the newspaper, or even at your local track. Many times, families may bring old bikes to the track which they're looking to sell. As children outgrow their tiny bicycles, they sell them and buy larger ones. Now, this is often a good option because you can see the bike and test it out on the track before you buy it. Now, personally, <laughs> I've never bought a used bike, so I can't give a whole lot of advice, but you obviously want to inspect the bike carefully, make sure nothing is broken, missing or damaged, you know, no cracks in the metal and the welds and all that sort of thing. And beyond that, I would say just be a wise shopper and don't buy anything used if you're not totally comfortable with the transaction. New bikes can be bought from three main locations, bike shops, online, or discount in sporting goods stores. I highly encourage you to support your local bike shop and purchase a bike from them. However, bike shops can sometimes be a difficult place to find a good bike. See, because there are so many different types of bicycling, like road bikes and beach cruisers and mountain bikes, BMX bikes, fixies, cyclocross bikes, and more, well, many bike shops specialize in only one or two specific styles. In fact, I've never seen a local bike shop selling every style of bicycle in stock. Therefore, even if you live in a big city with multiple bike shops, it can still be difficult to find a bike shop with a large selection of BMX bikes. It's not just about finding a wide selection of bikes, it's also about finding good people who run the shop. In all my years of cycling, I only ever found two bike shops that I really liked. And unfortunately, I can't recommend those bike shops to you because the owners have long since retired. First was a great guy named Ken Schneider, who owned a bike shop called Schneider's Bikes in Cleveland, Ohio, for over 40 years. And next was Brad Wasser, who owned a bike shop in North Hollywood, California, called Metropolis Bikes. I mean, heck, even Captain Kirk bought his bikes at Metropolis. Both of those guys were the best. And I have yet to find any other bike shop with their passion and aptitude. In my experience, most bike shop employees are a lot like unscrupulous used car salesmen. You know, they aren't really there to help you or educate you. 
They're just there to push merchandise out the door. Don't assume people know what they're talking about just because they own or work at a bike shop. Have a healthy skepticism, shop around, visit multiple bike shops, read reviews, and find one that you believe is trustworthy and knowledgeable. Buying a bike online has distinct advantages and disadvantages. The biggest and most obvious disadvantage, well, you can't see, touch, or ride the bikes. <laughs> and the biggest and obvious most advantage, well, you have the widest possible selection of bikes in the entire world. So my advice would be, if you're someone who is familiar with bicycles and you, you know, kind of know what you want as your first BMX race bike, it's fine to purchase your BMX race bike online. Now, if you're very new to bicycles in general and you aren't very knowledgeable about bikes, well, you might be better off going to a bike shop and seeing the bike in person. However, if you took the time to ride a loaner bike at a BMX track and you were really comfortable with that bike, well, you could just buy that same bike online and you know that it's going to work just fine for you. Now, because I'm really experienced with BMX bikes, I bought my Chase on the internet, directly from Chase Bicycles at BMX Racing Group. Now, other online bike shops I've used are uh, Dance Comp, JNR, Albs, um, Pork Chop BMX, and BMX Guru. I've never had a problem ordering from any of those places. And as a side note, I got to give thanks to Pork Chop BMX for their parody logo of one of my all-time favorite bands, the Dead Milkmen. Finally, discount and sporting goods stores like, you know, JCPenney, Kmart, Dick's, Sports Authority, REI. Don't buy a bike from any of these places. Walmart, Target bikes. I mean, these types of stores sell bicycles which are designed to be ridden on gentle bike trails or for children to ride over their friend's house in the neighborhood. The bikes sold in discount stores are not rugged or strong enough to stand up to the rigors and battering of racing on a BMX racetrack. These cheap bicycles aren't bad bicycles. I mean, they're actually good for a family outing like this, but they're really bad if you want to race them like this. Now, this is not just me being some kind of you know, pretentious bicycle snob. I mean, the bikes themselves often carry warning stickers on them, which specifically tells consumers not to use them for racing. Even the owner's manual tells you not to use those bikes for competition. And parents, you know, they often make this mistake because parents don't know any better and they want to save money, which is fine. It's perfectly understandable. And, you know, when parents discover that a quality BMX bike costs $500 and they see a bike at Target, which looks the same to them and it costs $80, naturally, parents want to buy the $80 bike. But the build quality of that $80 bike is far inferior to the $500 one. Discount store bikes are for leisurely neighborhood rides, not for racing on trails and jumps. So in alphabetical order, here are some of the best quality and most respected brands of complete BMX bikes. Now note that some of these companies sell bikes in bike shops and in big discount stores. For example, Mongoose sells excellent BMX race bikes in bike shops but they sell very low quality bikes at discount stores. The $90 Mongoose at Target is not as good as the $500 Mongoose at the bike shop. Now, a few companies that don't offer complete bikes, but they make really good frames, and once you're more experienced and you wanna build a custom, you know, these are some great brand names to consider. And note, all the ones in blue are made in the United States. Finally, here are some very popular high-end BMX brands that you do not want to buy. These companies make good bikes, but they only make BMX freestyle bikes, not race bikes. 
That leaves us with the final step, finding a BMX bike which is the right size for the rider. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> the BMX community is embarrassingly archaic and primitive in this regard. Sizing a BMX bicycle is almost impossible to do properly. Now, many sizing chart resources say that the age and the height of the rider determines the wheel size. Well, that's not really accurate. Others say that you should focus on the length of the top tube. Now, this approach is also incredibly inaccurate. I mean, as human beings, we are all different heights and weights, right? Our arms and our legs are different lengths. Our torsos are different dimensions. And that shifts our center of gravity. Now, these variations in our body proportions means that the bicycle frame length and the seat height and the crank length and the handlebar height, the width and the angle of the handlebars and more are all equally important geometries. All of those angles and distances alter our optimal body positioning. The road bike community is far more intelligent and advanced than BMX when it comes to properly sizing a bicycle. And they have access to very complicated machines to measure and adjust all these variables in order to properly fit a rider to a bicycle. The road bike community changes the geometry and measures the angles and analyzes videos of one's gait and cadence and evaluates all these biomechanics to determine the best possible ergonomics for a bicycle. That's pretty awesome and really impressive. Regrettably, the BMX community is, is not this technologically advanced or sophisticated. BMX bike manufacturers and BMX bike shop employees lack the precision of these cool road bike machines, which calculate all these geometric factors. So, since we don't have that type of technology to help us, how can you find the proper size of BMX bike? Well, before we answer that, you need to know what's available. So, for children, these are the sizes of bikes that you're looking at. So we have bikes with tires that are 12 inches in diameter, 14 inches, 16 inches, and then you start to get into the more professional kind of quality bikes. We have the 18 inch micro bikes, the 20 inch minis, the 20 inch juniors, and the 20 inch experts. Now, this is very, very confusing if you're new to BMX, because of course they're not just small, medium, and large. That's very understandable. But what the heck is a mini? Is a mini bigger or smaller than a junior? Or is a junior bigger than a micro? Like, what does that mean? So looking at this little graphic, you now understand what those terms mean. So micros are the smallest. Then it goes minis are a little bit bigger, juniors, and experts. So these are the bikes that are for kids who are like 12 and under. For teens and adults, people who are 13 and older, you have a 20 inch Pro like this one, a 20 inch Pro XL, 20 inch Pro XXL, <laughs> and 24 inch cruisers. Now, cruisers technically are between 22 to 29 inch diameter tires, but the 24 inches, those are probably the most common size of cruisers. Different bicycle manufacturers have different recommendations for sizes. For example, here is a sizing chart from DK Bicycles, and you can see they suggest pro-size bikes be ridden by people who are 5 foot 6 to 6 feet tall. However, if you look at the sizing chart from Haro Bikes, they suggest pro bikes be ridden by people between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 10. Furthermore, the dimensions of the bikes also vary from one manufacturer to the next. For example, the top tube length on a pro bike manufactured by GT measures 20.75 inches long, and the top tube on a pro bike from Chase is 20.5 inches long. 
In other words, the actual measurements associated with these size designations will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. The code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. So how do you know which size is right for you? Well, let me give you three options to sizing a bike. The best approach would be if you had a BMX track near you, which had a supply of loaner bikes in different sizes. Let's pretend that the track has a bunch of Haro bikes and you're 16 years old and you're five foot nine. So that means you want to look at a Haro sizing chart since these are Haro bikes. And you can see that that means at that age and that height, you can ride a Pro or a Pro XL. I would suggest taking at least three test rides. One on the recommended size, one on a size larger, and another on a size that's smaller. See how those three bikes feel and use that as a start to determine what is the most comfortable for you. If you can't do multiple test rides at a BMX track, try to find a bike shop with different sizes of the same bike and take test rides at the bike shop. And finally, if you can't ride a test bike, you'll just have to buy a bike online and rely on those manufacturer sizing charts. And that third option is gonna be the case for many of us. You know, we just have to buy something close to the recommended size. And through the process of trial and error, you learn to change the handlebar height, the crank length, and so forth in order to get the bike to fit properly. Let's summarize everything that we've learned about getting your very first BMX race bike. So first thing is your budget should be, I'd say around 300 to $800. And this is in the year 2022. Now on the low end, you're looking at a used bike and on the higher end, you're looking at a new bike. You're gonna to wanna to buy a complete, a bike that's already put together. You don't wanna get a custom bike or build a kit bike as one of your first. You wanna make sure that you have the right frame size for your body so that you fit on the bike properly. If you're 13 or over, you probably want an aluminum frame. If you're under 13, you're okay using a high tensile steel. And finally, you wanna make sure that whether it's new or used, you want a good quality brand name of bike. Again, here are some quality brand names for complete bikes. But remember, I also told you there are a lot of great race frames available too. So while I don't recommend you build a custom bike as your first, you could buy a used custom bike as your first, as long as they're using any of these frames. Only legitimate racers even know about these brand names, so chances are if someone is selling a used bike built on one of these frames, it's probably put together with some pretty good components too. And what do you not want in a bike? Well, you don't want a freestyle or park bike because the geometry of those bikes is not correct for racing. You don't really want a 70s or 80s bike because they're really heavy and they're really overpriced. You know, if you've already got one, it's fine to use that, but I wouldn't buy something like that. And you can't have axle pegs on the bike. You don't want to have 25.9 gearing. You want to make sure that it's 44.16. And this is important because you might think, well, I could just change the gears. Well, no, you can't <laughs> because bike frames that are set up for 25.9 gearing, uh, typically they can't fit a chain ring that's as large as a 44. So that's why you have to make sure that you actually have 4416 on the bike frame when you buy it. And the final two things are that you can't have a bike that's brakeless. You have to have at least rear brakes and you don't need to have a gyro. You could have one on the bike, but it's really not necessary to have a gyro on a race bike. Well, that just about wraps it up, folks. Now you know many options on where to get a bike, uh, how much the bike's gonna cost, some technical information on good brands, um, the materials to look for, and 
ways to find the proper size of bicycle. That just about covers everything that you need to know before getting your first BMX race bike. And I have to say that I am truly excited for all of you who are going to experience that thrill for the first time. There's something genuinely magical about your first real bicycle. Now, I'm not talking about the first bike you ever own. I'm talking about the first good one. The first high quality bike. That bike. The well-made, carefully constructed one. That is the bicycle which really matters. The way it feels in your hands and under your feet. When everything fits and moves so smoothly, effortlessly, fluidly, coasting along the ground faster than you can run, it makes you feel like you're flying. That, that is the bike which opens worlds that you never knew existed. For some people, eh, a bike is just a bike. It won't ever be anything special. And I'm not talking to those people. <laughs> I'm talking to those of you who will cherish that bike, who will ride it. For you, that bike is going to transport you to places few have ever dared to imagine. Your bike will be your loyal stallion, the dragon you ride into enchanting adventures, the hovercraft with which you steal into enemy fortresses, the motorcycle that lets you escape from charging dinosaurs. You will imagine a thousand worlds upon that machine, worlds no one else will ever see. You will be the hero of your story, the rebel fighter, the noble knight, the warrior princess, the dreaded pirate, the intrepid explorer, the lone cowboy. And as you look to the horizon at sunset, you will understand that your good old days are happening right now. <laughs>